We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful, as always, Mr. Bob Cook. Oh, and yeah, what we're going to be down here. say again? Just sitting down here. Just sitting down, sorting Just himself. Making myself out. comfortable for the next half hour. Yes, half an hour. I'll remember that. So or whatever what we do, I about do the backup time. You're responsible for the time. I know, and it, but it's shutting you up sometimes, Bob. It's difficult. <laughs> What we're going to be talking about in this podcast is five things I wished I'd known before I became a psychotherapist. Interesting topic. Yeah, I'd be interesting for the people listening. I know they're going to listen to what we're going to come up with. It'd be interesting for the people listening to just think about, well, I wonder what things I wish I'd known before I stepped into this career. And feel free to comment on the the YouTube channel or on Spotify and let us know. Yeah, that might be different or similar. You kick off then. Probably one of the things I wished I'd known was that I need to be all things to all people, as in a marketing person, you know, a business person. Being self-employed for me was a big wake-up call and I know not everybody who's a psychotherapist is self-employed they can be employed by somebody else but the business side of things I hadn't got a clue about okay so what you wish you'd know more about was that um not so much about being a successful effective psychotherapist but in terms of selling yourself afterwards so that you can get out to people publicly and also to mean you know economically as well of course that your your practice will flourish yes I didn't think about that at all I just thought people would automatically come and find me (laughs) (laughs) yeah so so it's like you're which is very I think very um it's a compliment to you that where you were coming from which is very much is about How can I be an effective psychotherapist to my best abilities to help people rather than thinking, well, you know, how can I actually be, well, social, I don't know when you started, but in my day, social media wasn't around. So there we are. But how can I be on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn and all that sort of stuff? Yeah. Because when I started, none of that was there. Well, no, I, I can remember when I was doing my training that, you know, they, they were talking about yellow pages when they started and, you know, but now you you need to be a social media guru. Like you said, you know, with, with Facebook, with Instagram, with TikToks, with all this sort of stuff, it's not just putting it in the yellow pages. Google, having, you know, Google advertisements. Now, most of my clients come from Google. They've found me on the internet. And so you, I'm assuming as you've gone along, you've become quite au fait with these social media platforms today then. I've become better. I wouldn't say I'm au fait with them. I, but it's, you know, it's not a full-time job being a psychotherapist. It's like half of my day is spent on doing marketing and business admin and all that sort of stuff, which I didn't foresee at all. No, I, 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 I didn't either, actually, though probably a little bit more than you. In another vein, I always, it's interesting because actually I don't know where this has come from. But anyway, I'll go on. I was going to say, and I'll continue to say, I always, always from the beginning, believed very much in putting eight and nine percent of what I earned into advertising. And that was always... I was just thinking where that came from. I must have heard somebody. That's a really good thing to have, though, Bob. Absolutely. Uh, And I remember it took a lot out of me because I didn't. uh, The training was very expensive. And when I started to see clients, of course, um, 
it's like what eight percent of all I earn going back into advertising, yellow pages, and all sorts of other things. Um, but I, I, I stuck to it, and I think I started to develop. I didn't start to because I, I realized it worked out for me. People came, uh, my advertising worked. I realized that's the way to go, and I always followed it. Yeah. I think there's a there's a tipping point with it. Do you know what I mean? When it's a struggle when you're first starting off, but yes. then the more clients you get, the easier it becomes. And there's that point where it, it's just like the wheels are turning and everything is okay. But it is a struggle when you first start. Well, even today, you know, I I I take well four weeks ago, and the, the bill is waiting for me to pay. I um, put. Um, and spent £1,500 on a full page in the UKCP magazine. That's our regulating body. Uh, or the equivalent would be BACP. Yeah. Um, because they're both as expensive. Um, advertising the next two conferences I do. So the one thing I haven't done so well in all this lot is chasing where the, the people come from. So the other thing with what you've just said is it takes a lot of courage at the beginning to do that, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That tipping point, till you get to that tipping point. Yeah. It's like um, a step into blind faith. Yeah. In other words, you know, I hope it works. And I think that, you know, maybe another thing that I didn't realise before I started is, the longevity of it that you know 12 months two years into it you, that's when you start reaping the rewards of the work that you were doing 12 months two years ago you mm. can't come into this and expect everything to just fall at your feet in the first six months unless you're very lucky well if i look at my career um well i'm really bearing out what you said yeah, the work that you do before and building the structures of the house or the platform, whatever it is, means that the house, the structures will not only build, but build up in a, you know, you know, substantial structures. And if yeah. you've got the structures, yeah, then the rest will follow. Absolutely. Good foundations. That's what we need. So yeah. that, that's a really good, that's a really interesting one. I'll, I'll share then my first I wish I'd really understood that how much of my own therapy I needed to do to mm. become the therapist I needed to be. Yeah. I never really, I went into therapy before I became a psychotherapist. So I was a politics lecturer and my, you know, psychological, emotional side of myself wasn't that healthy. It took me into therapy. And at that time, I had no idea I wanted to be a psychotherapist. Um, and it was in the first year of that that my eyes opened up to the power of psychotherapy because I started to feel better, if you like. I don't know if better is the right word. Yeah. Um, and, and by chance, somebody said to me at a party I was at, actually, um, but they were going to train to be a psychotherapist. Why don't you do it? And it was a bit of a while before I decided to leave the career that I was in as a politics lecturer to be a psychotherapist. But at no time did I think that I would be in psychotherapy for the rest of my career. And I'm one happy person that you did, Bob. <laughs> Yeah, and I didn't. I didn't think about it. I didn't think about the cost to it. I don't mean financial cost. Yeah. I mean the emotional cost. Well, financial cost is with it, but actually, yeah. I didn't think about it. I did remortgage my house to pay for my training and therapy. Wow, that's therapy. commitment. Yeah, and it all came from the power of therapy. In other words, how I started to change. Yeah, uh, but I didn't ever put the two together. Unbelievably, that I would how important it was that I stayed in in my own therapy and understand myself so that I could do the best job for the clients. Uh, I, I understood that as it went on. Yeah, 
Yeah. I never really, I never thought, for goodness sake, when I started to be a psychotherapist, I've been in therapy for a year, I didn't think I then would have access to therapy for the rest of my life. I didn't think that I would believe, and I didn't back then, that to be a successful psychotherapist, you always need to have access to therapy and having a have an actual priority to dealing with your own trauma. To be Absolutely. To yeah. And it's like that age old saying about, do you know what I mean? There's a reason why you were told to put on our oxygen mask first before we help other people. We've got to be in the right place emotionally mm. and mentally in mm. order to do the best for our clients. And I, I've always, I intellectually can understand this, but there's a part of myself which says that I never really understand why people who come into our profession, training-wise, don't understand that. Yeah. I didn't understand it. I didn't think that I would have to have my talking own... To you, yeah, own. talking to you now, but it became, it became a mantra of mine. I do understand it intellectually at one level, of course. In other words, and you know, it's, it might be too overwhelming, too frightening, too economically expensive, many other things. So people don't spend the money or um, many other things to understand themselves and move on. I do understand that. And then at another level, if you're asking your own clients to do that, mm. I think it's, I don't know what I think. I think it's a bit, I don't like the word hypocritical, but it's it's not very good modelling that you don't do yourself. Yeah. So I really wish I'd understood that when I started, because if I did, um, would I have gone forward? <laughs> Probably still would have done, because <laughs> I, was, I was in therapy. So I understood the power of therapy. But I didn't really realise that I would still be in therapy, dealing with my own traumas, and perhaps not once a week, of course, and have, have access to therapy at the end of my career. Yeah. I think once you're in this job, you're just part of a a different world where it's okay to share experiences and thoughts and feelings and all that sort of stuff. It's mm. more acceptable somehow. Mm. That's true. That's true. Okay, second one for you then, Jackie? Second one for me, some things that I've written down. Um about self-care which I suppose links into what you were saying with the therapy side of things oh. and knowing when you sometimes need to take a break <laughs> you know life has a a way of throwing us a curveball and we need to be our own priority if we're not in the best shape then we need to be aware that we're not going to be very good at being a therapist oh. I, I couldn't agree more with you and I think that's Probably not taught enough in the trainings. I think I thought it was like a job and you just went and did it. I didn't, I don't think I realized that sometimes it takes an emotional toll on us as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. that's a really important one, I think. I think it's such a vital one. And as I said, I don't think it's, I, th I think hopefully we come to realize that. But I don't know how long it takes. And for some people, you know, as you know, I have many people rent rooms in my institutes and my side across the road. And I know many people who run psychotherapy centres and many, many, many therapists and many people come to supervision for me over many, many years. And I always get surprised that it takes them, not all people, of course, you know, how long to realise that? Mm. And sometimes they can come and say, oh, I'm seeing 10 clients a day. Yeah. Something. And and then they don't understand why they're burnt out. Yeah. I I attempted to do that initially because I when I was renting a room, I would go to Manchester for two days a week and I would try and squeeze as many in as I could. And it didn't last very long before I thought, I can't do this. This is... Burner. Yeah. And even the practicalities of letting one client go before the next one came in, I need to have a break between clients to, mm. to literally 
let one go and be ready for the new client, if that makes sense. Absolute sense. And I think therapists eventually um, start to have a priority of self-care. Though often they put economic costs and things like that. Well, for very good reasons. But eventually, unless they start to take care of themselves, mm -hmm. they'll feel the cost of that. Yeah. So I can understand that. So is it my second one now? It is your yeah. second one, yeah. So if you met me in 1984, because I went into training in 1985, and for many years, and in fact, my wife might still even say this about me now in terms of traits, what I'm going to say. Um, you know, I, I, you, you would certainly define me as a self-reliant loner. Wow. And so that leads on to what I'm going to say. If, if I'd have known the importance of support mm. and people having my back and the importance of cultivating that yeah, and trusting people uh, will support you and peer groups and then I think um, my professional career would have been a lot easier. Yeah. Because I was somebody yeah. who was very cut off from all that. And self-reliant loneliness sort of sums me up at that stage in my life. A bit like Lone Ranger. Yeah. I mean, Lone Ranger back in 1956, I don't know if anybody ever watched the original ones, but... They did a. I saw they did a film. Was about twenty years about the Lone Ranger. He did have one one friend, Tonto. Tonto, but <laughs> you know that was just, that was the, about it really. And uh, I I wish I'd realised that I needed to have support systems quicker than I did, and the importance of having somebody or people around you in this journey. Yeah. Yeah. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> and, and I think it's about having like minded people around you as well. <laughs> Do you know mm. what I mean? I think, yeah, I completely agree. Mm. And yeah. uh, I, I've worked a lot. I worked it out as I went along, did done quite a bit of therapy on it. And I still got traits of that, but um, I wish I'd realized it. Before, but because this profession particularly demands um, support, you know, support of other people around you. Yeah. Yeah. So Nobody... my next one, on. yeah. I, I I was thinking when you were saying that, and I'm not sure whether this is my psychotherapy training or the therapy that I had while I was doing my psychotherapy training, but I didn't realise how much it would change me and mm. that I would lose people along the way, mm. Mm. if that makes yeah. sense. No, that makes I, I'm sense. definitely not the person I was prior to my psychotherapy training at all. Mm. Mm. And the second part of that uh, is really important, what you just said there, is that you might lose people on the way. In other words, you surround yourself maybe with different types of people. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> an understanding about how some people can be toxic and potentially that I will choose not to be around those anymore. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Mm. Relationships changed when I became a psychotherapist. Yeah, and you know, I I always used to tell my trainees that that um, you probably won't be the same person when you mm. leave, it. and you might lose people on the way, and you may choose people to choose different people. Yeah, who are more healthy for you to be around. Absolutely, um, and it's a different relationship that you have with the people after oh, oh. than it is before. If that, yeah, if that makes it has been for me anyway. Uh, am I on to four or three? Three, yes, I no, yeah, you're you're on to three, yeah. Right. Um, I've got two or three in my head, but I'll do this one because I was thinking about this as you were talking. Oh, why? 
Um, I wish I'd had a sense of realism about this profession. Well, actually, uh, um, about uh, about the whole myth of what I call psychotherapy or psychotherapists. I used to believe that um, psychotherapists had the cure to everything. <laughs> yeah, I suppose <laughs> I did too. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, you know, once I became a psychotherapist and I built my own psychotherapy practice and that uh, I went on to, to create my own institute and my own family in a way, um, that everybody I met would be all loving and caring and take care of me and support me and all those sorts of things. Now, given I've just said the one about support before you, but I think what I want to say is that I think it's, the, how can I put this? Psychotherapists are human like everyone else. Yeah. It took me a long time to realise that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, I, it's I, a I thought really valid point. <laughs> yeah. I thought they were magic people. Yeah. And I got so much difficulties really in that because part of build up and practice and especially in this you have to be a business person where there's lots of aspects of reality and the yeah. other side of that it's all you know um a lot of people go into the world of psychotherapy because they're dealing with their own issues and they're they're dealing with their own traumas yeah. and they're dealing with all their own challenges and difficulties in life and i think i just thought i was moving into a world where everybody was sorted <laughs> I can 100% relate to that, Bob. And going along with that, which I think is really interesting, is that I thought I needed to be sorted to be a psychotherapist. Ah, oh, it goes along with it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I 100% agree with what you're saying. And it's... I, I've had to deal with the disappointment of that. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's gone with that, but I wish I'd realised that. It's like everything else, you know, would I then have gone on to move into this world? I don't know, but I think I wish I'd have had a little bit more uh, realism about this world. Yeah. You see, it's a scary thought because I'm thinking now that, you know, my clients probably think that I've got all my stuff sorted and the reality is I've not. But that yes, is one right. thing in my training that I liked. Mm is that we are allowed to be human. We are allowed to share our experiences, obviously, if it's in, you know, the benefit of the client. Mm. But I don't need to be perfect to be a good psychotherapist. Oh. Yeah. Next one, then? Um, my next one is that therapy is a process, not an event. Yes, it is. That's right. And the, it can be a slow process and it's not necessarily linear. Mm. We, we can we can be in a loop for quite a while with therapy. It's almost necessary to be that way. Yeah, that's right. And I think I'm very similar to you that I I think I moved into pro probably not as much as a lot of people actually but I still at the beginning of training thought of therapy in problem solving ways yeah. more rather than looking at the unconscious and developmental processes that underneath the challenges yeah and maybe that we were supposed to have all the answers or I thought we were supposed to have all the answers I soon learned that I haven't got them <laughs> Oh. Uh, another one I think I can't remember if it's the fourth or fifth but anyway courage yeah so I think I'd have liked to have had <laughs> to have really taken ownership of the fact that I had a lot of fundamental courage in what I did because I, I just used to talk a lot about, oh, I just, just happened to me. Yeah. Uh, I, and if I didn't really take on board the courage of a lot of the steps that I'd taken, I think I'd have actually um, been kind to myself. Yeah. Because you Took have built an empire. 
Yeah, but it took me a long time to realise that I was building a family. Yeah. It took me a long time to realise that um, I, I, a lot of the steps I took were courageous in nature. Mm. I mean, I calcul calculated risk as well, don't get me wrong. But I think I had a sort of a denial system about, oh, well, things just happened around me. Yeah. Rather than taking ownership of the steps the of my career. Yeah. yeah my absolutely. career. Yeah. yeah. It took me a long time to realize that it was a career, actually. Yeah. I know that sounds paradoxically, perhaps, but, you know, the fact that I was trained to be a psychotherapist and everything that went along with that. And that's obviously a career at one level. I mean, today many trainees ask me, "Oh, do do I get? Uh, will I get other jobs after this?" And sex, sex, sex. They are, so they think of a career structure. I never thought about it that way. I just, I just, um, in some ways, um, it, a lot of what I thought I did was blind faith. But actually, <laughs> so I think I would have liked to have been able to understand the courageous side of myself yeah i want to ask you a question bob you, you kind of touched on it with one of the things that you said would you if you knew what you know now would you still do the job that you do would you still have been a psychotherapist i'll take going to hit onto my fifth one in a minute uh, but the answer is yes um because there's no doubt no doubt in my head that um, psychotherapy is in my blood yeah. and way of life. And then where that comes from is um, my own therapy. In other words, to understand myself and to take ownership of what happened to me and the decisions I've taken and the toxicity of my history and... Um, how I've changed that with the helps of lots of people and how I'm a different person to what I was then. It's like light and day. So I want other people to have that opportunity like I did. Yeah, that's lovely, Bob. So that, so it's in my blood. Yeah. So that's why it's so hard for me to stop doing yeah. the job I do, even at the age of 73. Because You'll never stop off. <laughs> so built into my identity. Yeah. I built it, so, and I built a whole family as well. So letting go of a lot of things has been very hard for me uh, because I know I have, yeah, I know we only have so much time on this planet um, and I want to do other things. But the answer to your question is, Yes, psychotherapy became a way of life, from yeah. what I've just said. No. So when I when at thirty at the age of thirty four, I didn't. Uh, I've been a part time lecturer for, for six years. I went on part time for another two at least or three because I needed to fund the first two of my years of my psychotherapy training. But when I left that college. I remember throwing the keys in my car keys into the air and catching them, saying, Thank God I've finished. I need never go back. That was my wow. first career. Yeah. Second career, I can't even let go of the keys. <laughs> <laughs> the but mine. Yeah. They're light and day. Yeah. That's lovely. I, but you have, I know you said earlier on that, you know, things just happen to you. But you've worked, you still are working bloody hard at what you do, Bob. Mm. And that's what took me a long time to understand that it was work. Yeah. What a lovely position to be. It's letting go of all this now. And, I, and yeah, so that's a whole other podcast. But uh, and you want your fifth? Well, going on from what you said, and I'm just looking at, you know, five things I wished I had known before I became a psychotherapist was, and I don't mean this in a narcissistic, big-headed way, was how much we impact on other people. 
Oh, that's a lovely one. Yeah. 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 Do you want to say a little bit more though? But I know what you mean. Well, just even people like, when did I start seeing clients in 2014? I think it was. So it's like 10 years nearly now that I'll see people that I haven't seen in a therapy situation for six, seven years. And they'll still say to me, do you know, I always remember when you said this, or I always, you know, when I'm going through something, I always say, what would Jackie say? It, you know, when, when you hear that, it's lovely to know that you are making a difference in supporting those people. Yes, and I, could, I, I couldn't agree with you more. But I don't want that to no, sound big-headed or narcissistic no, no. or egocentric or whatever. <laughs> no, I identify with that completely. I completely identify what you talked about. I certainly didn't think about that in terms of my career for a long, long time until people, like you said, fed it back to me. Yeah. I don't see that's being read. It's almost like the opposite of being big-headed because it takes you a long time. It took me a long time to take ownership of that. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure I still do. I always say, oh, you'd have got there anyway. You'd have got there without me, whatever it is. Yeah. So there's so many more. I, and I was just thinking, oh, my last one it isn't perhaps what people want, you know, perhaps it's not for this podcast. But anyway, I'll say it. And then I thought, well, people listening will want a list of practical things. <laughs> like, like um, I didn't really realise how much, in inverted commas, of what I've just said, hard work it takes to get clients mm. uh, or practical things. But I'm going to leave the practical ones, perhaps, for another podcast for further five practical ones and go to a, uh, a, a one in the vein of what we've been talking about, really. And I think it's about opening my heart and love. What I mean by that is I never realised that um being a psychotherapist uh had it had emotional cost to it i never realized the emotional cost no. but i never realized the emotional benefit i would achieve personally myself which led of course to professional success yeah i never thought about either of those things no it's, it's a big thing, isn't it? And it's no wonder that we don't think about these things when we first start. I was far, far away to thinking about, well, you know, the more that, you know, if I can get to the grips of being, you know, take on board lovability for myself and open up my heart and humility and everything else that goes with it. And now I, to do, I never even thought about those things. No. Just by doing it, not only is really priceless for yourself, but what modelling that is for clients. And, you know, that's the way your own practice will grow. When you can be, when you can express, express, you know, your own humanity with the other person in front of you, healing will happen almost automatically. Yeah. And I think that's something that can't be taught, Bob. It has to be experienced and it has to be felt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, got, I, I like to think I've got somewhere in that, but it's come from always, it's come through exploration of myself. So I suppose I'm saying I didn't realize I was, this profession would mean that I would spend so much time in exploration self. But the other thing for people listening, is by doing that, not only will people be healed in front of you, but your practice will grow, mm. not the other way around. Yeah. Another good podcast, Bob. Have we done five each? I we think we've have. done more than five each. Yeah, we haven't gone to all the practical things I had in my head. No. You know, cost and money and all sorts of other things. Like, you know, I didn't realise the um, how much it would cost and financial cost and economic cost. And I think I haven't mentioned the big boom because actually, it, I know this sounds very strange, it might do people listening, but if you open your heart up, if you do the training, you do your own therapy, the rest will follow. 
if you start thinking about money start thinking about scrimping on all those sorts of other things and you keep your heart closed actually it will be harder to keep clients yeah yeah absolutely yeah sounds like i feel like i'm preaching for <laughs> everybody to become a psychotherapist the importance of uh understanding yourself and everything goes with it but those are the sort of things uh, but it's a very good question you ask then knowing all the if i'd have known all these things beforehand would i have gone into the psychotherapy profession a very good question i like to think the answer would have been yes you know in terms of the emotional but in terms of the emotional cost but the other side of it is you know, I know how much I changed positively. So it's just, it's got processes. I've sort of evolved um, as I've gone along in knowing these things. But if I'd have known them all beforehand, I think the answer would be yes, because my life is so enhanced today. How could yeah. I say no to that? Yeah, I feel the same. I think if anything, my one regret would be that I didn't do this sooner. <laughs> Yeah, and the the chain of events that got me to where I am, the people that I met by accident, that similar to you, you know, it, it was Sari who said, you know, why don't you do this? Mm -hmm. But if I hadn't met her through doing another job with somebody else, I probably wouldn't be sat here now. Well, I know I wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. We should do a podcast on qualities to enhance in the site. See perseverance. I would say yes. to people who listen to this podcast, as you listen to us, one of the things I want to say is just, you know, perseverance is so important. Mm. Not to stop at the first pit hole or yeah. branch in the road. Absolutely. Because, you know, I, I, I don't know whether listeners know this about me, but I was not, you know, I'm not a, a university graduate. I didn't go to university. I'm not that intellectual. Um, and I never thought I would be able to qualify as a psychotherapist. So I, I would have put blocks in my way, maybe, if this opportunity had come earlier. Mm. Yeah. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to say those things. You too, Bob. So what we're doing next time is... is um, I'm waiting. We've got, the, we've got the drum going. You know, the piece of the drum is building up. So we're going to know what we're going <laughs> This is one that's very close to my heart. It oh, is gosh. the growth of equine therapy. Oh, it's, this is your turn. It's my this, turn next yeah, time. I put this in because I wanted to, I, I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about your passion and your specialism, which I, I, the bits I do know is because when I was a lot younger, a lot younger in sort of 75 years, 75 lives ago, I used to train polo ponies. And I, I there's things I can offer to the conversation, not only about my history, You always also, offer something to the conversation, yeah, but Bob. I, this, you, you, I know it's a great passion of yours. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we're doing next time. Oh, I really look forward to that. Okie dokie, Bob. I'll speak <laughs> to you soon. So, yeah, bye-bye. Take care. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.